Okay, I want to welcome everybody and, and welcome to Dr. Marion Blank, who, who's here today, our special guest. And we're so lucky to have Dr. Blank here. Um, she has spent her entire career learning, studying languages and learning to read. And she's also an expert on autism. Um, she is the director of the Light on Literacy program at Columbia University and just has won so many awards in the field of education that there were really too many for me to mention. So I, I didn't list them, but she, I, I promise there's a lot. Um, she created the wonderful Reading Kingdom program, which many of you are Testing Mom members, so you, you know it through Testing Mom or otherwise. Um, she wrote The Reading Remedy. Uh, this book right here, um, a wonderful book on reading. The other book that she wrote, she's written other books too, but the other book is Spectacular Bond, which is a book uh, on autism. And um, I wanted to just tell you uh, quickly the story, Marion, of um, I gave this book to a friend of mine whose um, child was was diagnosed with autism. This was about a little over two years ago. I gave them this book and and then I didn't see her for like about two years. But we recently went out to dinner with them and the the mom came up to me and she said, Karen, I have to thank you because you changed our lives. And I said, what? I changed your life? What did I do? She said, you recommended that book to me. I didn't recommend it, I actually gave it to her. And uh, she said, it changed our lives. It changed my son's life. He's doing so well. We're following the program. It's wonderful. Um, so she could not stop raving about this book. And she felt like I changed her life just because I gave her the book. But you wrote the book. So for anybody who knows uh, a family whose child has been uh, diagnosed with autism, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. So I just wanted to say that. Um, even though we're talking about reading today, but I, I just wanted to say how, uh, what, a, what a wonderful book that is and um, how much I know that you, you have changed that family's life just by, giving, by having written that book. So. I'm sure you must hear that all the time, right? Well, thank you. No, it's lovely to hear. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so uh, moms and dads, uh, I just want to say welcome and, um, and welcome to Dr. Blank. Um, we are going to have a Q&A in just a little while. So uh, if you do have questions that, that maybe come to you as we're speaking, go ahead and type them into the Q&A box. You can just click Q&A on your screen and uh, type your questions there. And um, I'm gonna, we're gonna go over some material ahead of time and then we're just gonna open it up for your questions. So I guess my first question is, uh, what, how old should children be when they learn to read? Oh, that's a great question. And it, it really covers a lot of issues that are very rarely considered. Um, in the Scandinavian countries, or I don't remember if it's Denmark or Finland, they don't start teaching reading until seven years of age. Mm -hmm. And it's, the kids are much better prepared and they do extremely well. The problem is that there is this whole push in the United States for starting early, getting in early, being ahead of everyone. And so what happens is, even if a parent, for example, or a teacher said, you know, I'm not gonna teach this child till he's seven, that child would feel so inadequate relative to all the other children. So the peer pressure means in the United States, you gotta to learn to read early because it starts indefinitely in kindergarten and sometimes now in yeah. preschool. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you wanna prevent is your child feeling, oh, I can't do it. Everybody else can do it and I can't. So that's a problem we've created, but it's a problem we have to live with. So um, basically the par parents can do a lot with children from about four years of age on to prepare them. And then very often people will say, oh, I don't want him reading when he goes into school, he'll be bored. Well, he's gonna be bored in school anyway, because school is not that exciting. And it, I've never seen a teacher not welcome a child who knows how to read before they teach him. Mm -hmm. They love those kids and those kids get accolades. So. 
a lot, parents can do a lot at home and the kids feel great in the early grades of school. Mm. Well, so what should parents of very young children be doing just to plant the seeds, like uh, to, uh, to encourage their child to love to read when they're like two and three yeah. and even younger, you know? Well, again, you have to take a broad look at this. Um, one of the things that is really critical to good reading, particularly the comprehension aspect of reading, are higher level language skills. And it is not being discussed enough, but we are actually losing our language skills. Children are less sophisticated in language than they were 30 and 40 years ago. Part of the reason is that conversation is much diminished. If you go to a restaurant and you watch a family, you'll see the kids with the devices and the parents are very happy because they can eat dinner quietly while the child's with the device. But opportunities for good high level discussions are not as frequent as they used to be. And the other thing is that the devices make the children very intolerant uh, if they're overused. Devices are great, but if they're overused, they make the children very intolerant of situations which they don't control because they feel they have total control over the devices. But if they're in an, another setting where they don't have control, they basically say, I'm opting out. So it's very important to, number one, limit the devices. Okay. One of the things they should also do, which isn't, we won't go into it now at all, but the devices should be protected from electromagnetic fields because the children are very sensitive and little children under two or three shouldn't even be touching phones. They're very, but that's a physical issue. Um, but the biggest thing is limit the devices to probably less than an hour a day. And then you can do good games with them. You can do all kinds of treats and so on but you don't want the device to dominate the child's life. And then you make time for two things. One is good conversation, mm -hmm. which take place at the dinner table or, and reading good books to your children. Mm -hmm. And those, those sessions of reading good books should not be questioning sessions. They shouldn't be tests. They shouldn't be, well, what do you think the little boy was trying to do? And who else was with the little boy? And, it should be just reading and then you can make comments like, wow, he was brave. And you'll see your child will begin to talk very readily if they don't feel questioned, if they don't feel pressure of questions. And um, so uh, 20 minutes, a half an hour, preferably at least four or five times a week uh, at bedtime, around that time, just relaxing with a good book. There's, it's a fabulous experience. Everybody enjoys it. It really builds up a child's language skills mm -hmm. and it prepares him for all kinds of activities in school with no pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just reading to your child as, as much as you can or, yeah. and, and keeping it fun and warm yeah. and then talking and conversing with your child as yeah. much as you can. Yeah. Those are the two and most avoiding school-like tasks. Schools today, I've seen a lot of nursery schools and kindergarten mm -hmm. are asking the parents at home, to do phonics lessons with the children, yeah. to label, to have them label the sounds. And so that is generally very destructive and not constructive. And uh, it puts a lot of pressure on the children. Those who can do it don't need it. And those who can't do it just fail. It's, an, it's, an, it's a lose-lose situation as opposed uh -huh. to a win-win. Mm, okay. So um, tell me, um, I know that when, like my daughter didn't even start to to learn to to read until she was over seven like all mm. the kids in her class were reading mm. but she wasn't and i was very worried that she was behind kind of like what you described you know but she just wasn't ready to read now she loves to read uh, of course obviously she grew she grew up she loves to read great language skills but as a child she was she was kind of late to reading but i was wondering like why is it that some kids seem to just easily learn to read and other kids really struggle with it is there what what's going on there well it's there are very good they we've known this for a long time they're very good tests that can pick out in with a 15 no well let's say a 30 or 40 minute battery the, the child who's likely to fail in reading for example one of them but parents this isn't kind of helpful to parents 
Uh, one of the most common difficulties of children who have difficulty reading is what's called the naming problem. That's the kind of problem old people have. You know, you, you say, oh, I, I, I know that name. I know, no, what's his name? And the thing is when little children have it, you don't notice it in spoken language because they'll use the word that rather than the word. So whereas another child will say, oh, can I have the bottle? The child with a naming problem will say, can I have that? Uh, and you don't notice it. But the problem is in reading, essentially, basically a naming problem is difficulty in labeling nouns. In other words, you see an object, you have to label. No one ever has difficulty labeling a word like the or is or go, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, what happens is that in reading, early reading, every word is essentially a name. You're looking at a visual thing and you're having to name it. So a naming problem is, um, can be very, very crucial in early reading difficulties. But, uh, and it's easy to pick up, but uh, the, what the best thing that parents can, and that's one of the reasons I devised Reading Kingdom, uh, is that if you give um, multiple trials on the same word, so you're naming the same thing over and over again without it being boring, you're gonna, have, you're gonna prevent the naming problem from ever, from ever interfering with reading. And that's one of the main principles behind Reading Kingdom, where every word is taught with at least 45 to 50 trials in varying. So um, that's what, if, so if a parent is worried, starting Reading Kingdom when the children are about five, four and a half or five, is an excellent way to go. Uh -huh. um, and there are other things to, that can be done. Now, one of the really good things that all parents can do, and you can't hurt anyone doing it, and you can help all the children who need help, is to teach handwriting. You can teach keyboarding, but handwriting is very good. And the, they found in research that writing a word one time correctly is equivalent to nine times reading it. In other words, you, to get the same effect in your learning, you have to have seen the word nine times. Uh -huh. Writing demands much more control, much more accuracy, much more detail. Mm -hmm. And if children get that skill, mm -hmm. uh, it, it makes uh, reading move much more quickly. Now, schools increasingly do very little with writing. Yeah. And so the parent can easily do writing. We have a writing program on the Reading Kingdom site. We mm -hmm. have uh, one on the ASD reading site as well. And if you... Uh, literally work no more than five to ten minutes a day you can get a kid writing effectively in two months and then you just keep it up a few minutes a day to do writing a sentence writing a few words and writing is one of the most effective ways of helping reading with very little pressure mm. and how early can you start that uh, basically not before four five okay. is a good age uh, okay. one of the things that i do which always gets parents sort of why are you doing it, is I provide hand support for the young children. So someone said to me the other day, my little boy writes, but he writes backwards, so he does a J like this. So I said, no, if you use hand support, he's got the marker in his hand, and when he gets down to the bottom, you just don't let him go the wrong way. You just wait. The waiting and the being, so, and you just, and then he goes the other way. So hand support, which is a very gentle thing, it's not, and you're not doing it they're doing it. Hand support is very helpful to children, particularly now because a lot of children have fine motor problems that didn't exist years ago. Mm -hmm. And probably it relates to the devices and the fact that they're not playing with as many small objects mm -hmm. and puzzles and fitting together bits of, so that the fine motor skills aren't developing right. as well. Mm -hmm. So the hand support is a very, very effective technique. When they get to the bottom of the J, if they're starting to go the wrong way, do you nudge them the other way? Uh, I, I usually just stop and I, I wait. And then if they don't do it, I just say the other way. And then, uh, they, then they go. And the after other. a while, you can drop the verbal cue. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's very interesting. And I've always heard, too, that, that nursery rhymes are very important. Reading rhymes and things mm -hmm. like that to young children when before they're reading. Right. Reading them. Nursery. All kinds of wordplay, all kinds mm -hmm. of analysis. First of all, they love it, mm -hmm. and it gives them um, a very good sense of mastering language, and mm -hmm. that helps out in reading a lot. Mm. It, it, they, the fancy name for it is phonological awareness, but we don't right. have to go into the fancy name. 
<laughs> okay, okay. But that's, that. yeah, I, I've always heard that that's a good thing to help yeah. them pre-reading. It's kind of a pre-reading thing to do with them. Um, so but I also want to mention something which is really interesting is that when children learn to read, their language skills get better. So for example, if you say to a four or five-year-old, who is it reading it? How many words are there in the sentence, the girl is pretty? They'll say two. You say, what are they? Girl and pretty. They don't, once they start to read and you say, how many words are there in the girl is pretty? They'll say four. In other words, reading makes them much more, and writing makes them much more attentive to language. So it's, it's really nice. Each thing scaffolds on the other. Right. If you have good language skills, it helps you to read. Once you have reading, it helps you to increase your language skills. Uh -huh. So yeah. it's, uh, and, and if a child feels successful in that realm early on, uh -huh. it makes schooling so much more effective. Yeah. You know, I, I was, when I was little, um, I remember very vividly that I was put not in the, I was put in like the worst reading group. Oh, um, and uh, I still Unfortunately, that. that's what schools do. Yeah, I still remember that to this day that I was in, I would think I was a blue jay or something and I wanted to be like a red bird or and yeah. And my read, I guess I wasn't as good a reader as the other kids, and you know, and I that just kind of, that really hurt my my feelings. Even back then, I swear I still remember that. Oh, every yeah, everybody yeah. will report that. Just what you're they reporting. Do. They know that's that's what I said about the group pressure. Yeah, it's the t you could tell a child a million times you're different. Everybody's different. There's no problem. That isn't how they hear it. They hear it. I'm stupid. All the other kids are smart. So you want to prevent reading failure because it's so devastating to the child's psyche. Mm, yeah, yeah, no. So, um, well, um, talk about a little bit about, um, about the difficulty with phonics and how phonics sometimes can make it very hard for kids to learn to read. I, I know that, you know, some schools use phonics yeah. and that's their way. Um, but what are some of the challenges with that? Well, the problem is, and it, it, even the phonics adherents will say that uh, about 40% of children will read with anything. If you just expose them to enough. So you can use what's called whole language. You can use whole word. You can just read to the kid. You can, almost anything. So, and those are the kids that they say, well, phonics works with them, but everything works with them. Mm -hmm. But now you have 60% of the kids. And the, the criminal fact is that in the United States, 60% of children are failing in reading. These are normal, healthy, vibrant children who are failing in reading. And the reason they're failing is because they're being taught phonics. Be and people who believe in phonics say it's a religion. But take, for example, phonics will, see, if you have a language like Spanish or Italian, every letter has a sound. Mm -hmm. You don't have silent letters like the B in lamb. You don't have the E having five different sounds. As I think the E probably has, I think, I think, I don't remember if it's a, something like the A has like 10 sounds. So we have, there, you can't look at a letter, even right. we'll hold up a P and say to the child, this says P, but then when it's with PH, it's F, you know? And even then it's sometimes not F, because you can have a word like uphill, where you have a PH and it's a pu and a huh. So uh -huh. <laughs> what happens is they pretend in, that we have what's called a CVC, a consonant vowel consonant word, like cat. cat C is a, is a consonant, A is a vowel, T is a consonant. So they teach for months to the children who are having trouble reading these CVC words. But CVC, the, the estimates vary, but in general, it's said that fewer than 20% of words in English can be sounded out. So what happens is, hmm. for a, within a few months, if you're learning to read, you get all these rules. So like one rule is the silent E rule. So you say when, it, when you have an E at the end of the word, it doesn't say anything, but it makes the vowel inside the word long, which is a very complex rule. But it explains, for example, why C-A-P is cap and C-A-P-E is cape. But there are as many exceptions to the rule as there are instances. So for example, love is not low. 
and give is not give, and uh, done is not done, and we have, so there isn't one, some, some linguists have done it now, there isn't one rule that children are given that doesn't have exceptions. Mm -hmm. So if you have a child struggling to read, Okay. And then he comes to word that he can't, and then he has to say which rule applies here, because the number of rules they discuss it. People who are very proud will say they only have to learn sixty rules. Sixty rules is a lot. The ones who are purists say they have to learn six hundred rules. Well, there's nobody going to learn. That's just to get to third grade reading. Oh my gosh! So what yeah. happens is people when they discuss father don't discuss the fact that the kids can't do the rules. Plus, there's another interesting thing. And then I'll, I'm, I'm just giving you a taste of what the problems are in phonics. If, in English, if you take a lot of the consonant sounds, you can't say them without what's called a schwa at the end. So if I say, the, I hold up the letter C, I say, what is it? You'll say K, but a C isn't K, it's K. Because it, in cat, it's not K at a, it's cat. So the thing is, what you, now there are a few uh, there are a few consonants in English where you can sustain it, like M. So if you want to blend mat, it'll work. But for most words, it won't. So what happens is, even when the children try to blend, they mm -hmm. end up with something that does not sound like the word it's supposed to come out. In other words, if you sound out cat, it comes out as kata, which is kata, which is not cat. Uh -huh. So the, what happens is the kid has to then sit back and say, well, what is ka'at closest to? Oh, I get it. It's cat. Now, if you have to do that for one word on a page, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You have to do it for two words on a page. If you have to do this for 10 words on a page, you're just going to throw out the book and say, I hate it. Now, one of the things that children will say who've been through this is I detest reading. They tell you how much they, and the reason they hate it is because they have to go through this laborious procedure, which doesn't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they keep insisting that it does, but it doesn't because the kids can't do the basics. And then I'll leave it, I'll, have, I'll add one other thing. Mm. We know that for reading to take place, the words have to go from what's called the sort of phonological processing from the sounding out thing to a different part of the brain where it's automatic. When you look at a page, you don't go say things like catastrophe. You say catastrophe. So what happens is it has to go to what's called the automatic reading. Phonics has no way of getting a child to automatic reading. Mm. And they don't discuss it. They just say, so I've discussed it with some phonics adherents and I say, but he's just sounding out. He can't, he, he's not getting order. She says, It'll happen. They just say, it'll happen, but it doesn't happen. And you see kids plodding along painfully. And once a kid hates reading, you can't teach him. He no longer, he no longer believes he's capable of learning to read. Mm. So all this can be overcome with the right methods. And that's why, on the, for example, one of the things that we do on the Reading Kingdom side, we just came out with a thing called Spelling Ninja. Because mm -hmm. I told you how important writing is, how important spelling is. Right. And if you really develop, have techniques for developing solid long-term memory, you never lose it. It takes a few weeks to build it in, but a child who has long-term, in other words, the difference between you say to a child, here's the word, whatever, home, you take it away and say, write it, and he's struggling, and the child says, okay, I'll write it. So if a child can write quickly and automatically and correctly, he's going to be reading okay. Mm -hmm. So the Spelling Ninja program does that. So in other words, we're trying to address what we know are problems in reading, and it's possible to do it, but the current teaching doesn't do it. And that's why we have a 60% failure rate, mm -hmm. which is unimaginable. I mean, how, I mean, if, could you imagine if 60% of the cars came off the assembly line damaged and defective, the country mm -hmm. would be in an uproar. But 60% of children are coming out of school feeling inadequate and defective, and this is just being accepted. And when the kids, kids can't learn to read or are struggling with reading, do they then get diagnosed with a learning disability? Is that what tends yes, to happen? Yes, absolutely. Okay. They never say it's, well, a few people say it's the system, uh -huh. but, but usually, and now the big thing is to call them dyslexic. So we officially have in the country now 20% dyslexic. 
But mm -hmm. that means we have 20% of brain damaged children with that single disorder. That doesn't yeah. exist. No, no disorder mm -hmm. exists. In, I said to people, autism, which is a major disorder and now considered an epidemic, is 1% of the population. But people are happily going around saying, well, 20% of our children are dyslexic, which is saying 20% of our children are brain injured, which is yeah. crazy. They're just, they're just struggling with reading because of the way it's being taught to them. Exactly, you said probably. it perfectly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so um, so would you say, you know, I know that as parents, we, we do spend a lot of our time when they're younger, I know I did, trying to teach my child the letter sounds or yeah. recognize letters or name letters. Is Are yeah. those things we should be doing as for the little? I don't think really? so, I don't not think really. so. Uh, okay. There are good reasons not to, uh, I won't go into all of them, but the point is that, for example, one of the, I'll just give you an example. They find that at a certain stage of learning, in learning to read, kids will write the word as if it's a letter name. So they'll write easy as an E and a Z. Right. And they say, this is a stage of spelling development. It's not a stage of spelling development. It's the result of having pounded in letter names. Okay. Which don't need, you don't need the letter names. It's a layer of labeling, which is very hard for the children. Mm -hmm. um, which people find hard to believe because every, now the other thing is, and it's so, when we, we didn't get into it, but when children are taught to write in English mm -hmm. and they're given very little instruction, they're taught to use capital letters. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because block letters are easier for the teachers to deal with. But I, when I teach handwriting, I teach lowercase letters first because that's what you read. 98%, 99% in print is lowercase. So if you teach the children to write the lowercase, they're writing and they're reading match. It makes things easier. Right, right. Okay. So yeah. all every problem that we're facing in reading and writing and comprehension can be dealt with if we just are willing to take on new techniques. Mm, mm, okay, got it. I see that. Um, so... Um, so when when kids are younger, is it easier to step in and help kids when they're younger and you see that they're struggling versus when they're older? Does it become a lot more complex when they're older? Well, that's a big, those are big questions in okay. sort of neuroscience. Okay. Uh, but certainly, for, just from a behavioral point of view, you've the longer you stay in a, in a system where you feel you're inadequate, the worse it is. Yeah. So... Um, the big thing is to prevent reading failure. Mm -hmm. And the way, I, and I've done it with many, many families, I, I, we test children and say, this child, you can predict with about 90% accuracy which child's gonna have difficulty in reading. And with every child where I've done that, and I've said to them, let's teach him to read early, and we've used various of my reading programs like Reading Kingdom, uh, I've gotten good readers who love reading. Mm -hmm. As long as you prevent failure, the child's gonna love reading. Okay, okay. Um, and and one, one more thing before I start to ask, to take everybody's questions. Um, let talk about a little bit about the non-content words. Oh. And because uh, I, I always find that so interesting yeah. that about that we have to, that what they are and that it's important to just teach kids yeah. to recognize them and why. So let's talk a little about that. That's, a, it's, it's a great area. Um, in English, we have two sets of words. The vast majority of words are what are called content words. They're the nouns, the verbs, the adjectives, girl and pretty and run and hike and right. whatever, pillow, whatever you. And then there's a very small group of words, 200 altogether, but only really 100 that matter to children, uh, what are called non-content words. And the reason they're called non-content words is because they don't seem to refer to anything. Words like the and is and was and hag and uh, if and of. Now, they are not taught to any degree in phonics because they don't follow the phonic rules. They're often, the children are told these are bandits who are very bad because they don't follow the rules. And so, um, because if they did, he would be hair, they would be fair, a was would be was. So the children are told, well, learn these by sight, but how someone learns by sight without being taught anything, no one knows. But the other thing is these are absolutely critical to meaning. And, which is, I'll say to people, 
Now here's this group of little words, non-content words, not important. What percentage of a page do they occupy? And people said, well, maybe 20%, maybe 30%, uh, 60% or more of every page of print mm -hmm. is a non-content word. Even taking the famous, the cat in the hat, the Seuss book, mm -hmm. the, in, the. Three of the five words are non-content words. Right. And these words make an, it makes an enormous difference, for example, if you say the girl is sitting or the girl was sitting. If, if, if you say that is a boy, if you say that is not a boy. So these are tremendous modulators of meaning. Mm -hmm. And if you teach children, for example, the whole past tense in English is basically comes through the small words attached to verbs, is going versus was going, did go, and so on. And so in order to read with comprehension, you've got to have a very clear awareness of the non-content words. And they are not taught in, mm -hmm. in almost any program except the one I've developed because that has been an area of interest of mine for years. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing when you say, now for a good reader, the ones who are gonna to learn to read, they do pick these things up. But the 60% who don't, can you imagine you are giving them no tools to handle the majority of words they see on the page. Right, other than memorize what they look like so you know what it yeah, is. Yeah, but then they don't know their meaning. Even if they right. can identify that you must know the meaning. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, and, and there are ways to teach that, mm -hmm. uh, which is built into our programs, but um, no one teaches them. And, and it's terrible that they're called non-content because it makes it sound as if they're unimportant. Mm -hmm. And they are the glue of the language. They are what holds the sentences together that right. make the meaning of the set of the text. Right, right. Well, okay. So I, I have lots of questions that people have started to ask. So let me go ahead and give you some of their questions. Um, and, and some of this we've talked about a little bit already, but uh, maybe you'll expand a little bit. Um, so uh, the first question is, our son does well in phonics, but not so good as a reader. So maybe I'm not so surprised given what you've just said. Yeah. What do we need to do to help him become a better reader? What would you say? Well, um, and I don't know the age. I, I'm not sure what yeah. age. It's, it's helpful, you guys, if you put your child's age in, I yeah. think, a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, the best thing from, with that little bit of information, the best thing would be to start increasing comprehension so that you're presented. And one of the programs we have for that called Story Smarts, it's now available in software. Um, it gets the children to understand the essence of how ideas are put together in sentences and how you give summaries. So that's, uh, then um, the other thing is to read to the child quite a bit and don't question but one of the is just comment about what you've read and get the child to comment back. So let's say you're reading about a lion that escaped from the zoo or something, and you sort of say, uh, well, I imagine they're going to have to do something to try and catch the lion, you know, and you'll get the child discussing it. So you want to really develop the comprehension skills. Plus, it will it's very likely if you develop the writing skills, the writing of sentences, mm -hmm. uh, like in Spelling Ninja, his uh, reading skills will go up. Mm, so we're, but, you know, I need more information, but that's my first take. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, okay. So <laughs> that's a hard one. Uh, what can we do to distract our, um, what can we do? Uh, how, how do you distract children from their devices during quarantine? <laughs> that's a, that's oh, a, I, th I think one of the best things to do for some reason, I don't know why it's the case, children take the written word as gospel. And if you make up a schedule, and you can have it in three or four different places, it can be right. nice, you know, have a few decorations on, but very soon, uh -huh. at 8.30, we're gonna be doing this. At, you know, and so he knows the course of the day. And mm -hmm. if you slot in, let's say, two periods of the devices, and it's understood that they hand you over the devices at the end of each of those two periods, you've gone a long way. Because mm -hmm. you basically said this is rather than have a fight each time and say, right. now come on, give me it, you know, that kind of right. thing. So written schedules, very simple ones, the child can help it. You can have the child even help you determine when the two periods of the day are. 
but the schedule sort of becomes like a guide to the child and he says okay i i get it mm -hmm. not easy but it's much easier if you do it that way if you've made if you've made some rules that you've all agreed upon and they're posted and it's like okay exactly. this is the time when we don't have our devices right we'll read a book or we'll do something else and physical activity is right. really good a trampoline for some kids is absolutely it's not expensive and it's mm -hmm. a fabulous way of burning off and, and now that we're in you know heading towards the summer you can go out more and mm -hmm. hopefully there's a garden and you know things of that sort right right okay good um okay so here's um assuming the child is ready and age appropriate this is like late five six how important is it to be systematic about teaching a child to read like sight words letter combinations that sort of thing well i think the it depends if if the if they're discussing now the quarantine and being at home, it's very important to be systematic. It just makes things go easier. If the child is doing well in school mm -hmm. and you don't have to take on that burden, then right. let the school be systematic. Okay. Uh, you don't have to, parents have a hard enough job. They don't need to look for additional work. Right, to be teaching reading, but they could be, they could just be talking to their child. Yeah, and reading, reading to them, them. reading right. to them is invaluable. And discussing the book with the child. Yeah. Okay, now here's one. Uh, oh, I, uh, I, I want to mention a related activity, which is very good, is watching movies with the child, mm -hmm. which is sometimes a lot more fun than mm -hmm. the book. And there are lots of good books that are available through movies. Mm -hmm. um, very good stories on science fiction, on exploring the world, on uh, mm -hmm. wild animals, all kinds. So uh, videos are an excellent, a tool that can work just as effectively as books for teaching comprehension. So what would you do? You would watch, let's say, a documentary together or, you know, a science show, Nature's Channel, and then talk about it? Is what, what I tell parents to do is to watch it themselves first so okay. they know how it goes and they're ready to answer questions. And then it's good to, and it doesn't have to be documentaries, it can be good movies, right? There's an old movie, which I was recently saw again, um, Empire of the Sun, which is a boy imprisoned in a Japanese camp during World War II. Um, it's good to break it up into, let's say, 20 minute, 25 minute segments and discuss the segment the next day. It's almost like you're reading chapters in a book. Okay, okay. And kids love it, and it's a great way of teaching history, which mm -hmm. kids need. One of the big problems in comprehension in the later grades is that the kids need a big knowledge base. You can't discuss the Civil War if you have no idea what the 1800s were like, if you have no idea what this, the, mm -hmm. the divisions of the United States were. So films are a wonderful way of giving children the knowledge base they need. The knowledge base, and then when you discuss it, they, they start to, their, their comprehension improves. Exactly. Uh, that's great. And it's okay. almost like teaching them how to write an essay. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I use it as a basis for eventually teaching them how to write essays. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, on what they've read, just like they can write a book report. Uh, on what they, so they can write about what they've seen, what they've exactly. read. Exactly. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, okay, so my wife uses My Baby Can Read for their two-year-old, and her their son can read, seems to read words at two. Do you recommend programs like that? I, I you know, it's, I, I, I don't recommend it. Uh -huh. uh, in general, it doesn't feel like a, I hate the word, like an organic activity for a two-year-old. That isn't what two-year-olds should be doing. Right. Um, but do, two-year-olds do point to signs and they see the big M and they say McDonald's. That, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't put the pressure to, on the two-year-olds. I, I can't prove that I'm right or wrong on this. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wouldn't do it. I don't see any gain from it. And there's so much more fun things to do with a two-year-old. Why spend it with reading, you know? <laughs> with, with teaching them to read. That's right. Uh, with teaching and reading, which isn't sort of what they're into it to. Right. They'll get that later anyway. Yeah, that's what I think. I don't think it's tragic and, and maybe it were, it's effective. I just wouldn't uh -huh. use my time that way. Okay. Um, and then uh, how do I choose books for uh, a child who's a third grader, like an older well, child? Well, first of all, there are great websites where you can just 
uh, go on to say books recommended and there are a lot of Newbery Prize awards and things of that sort. And then you just, they'll tell you the theme. This is a pioneer family, you know, settling in Nebraska in 1800. And then you see if you want to read it. The thing that is very important in the books you select is to cover a range of topics. If a child has a favorite topic, that's great, but that should not be the only thing you read about. So if a child loves rockets, every fifth book or every fourth book could be about a rocket, but in between, there'll be something about the development of the country, there'll be some famous person, uh, some good biography and so on. Um, you wanna vary the content because that teaches different vocabulary, mm -hmm. different, different vocabulary comes with science than comes with a novel. Um, it teaches uh, different information. It teaches a different logic of organization. And the, the more varied, these are called texts. That's the term for that. Mm -hmm. And the more varied the texts that the child encounters, the better the child's language becomes. Mm. So, so make sure that you read the nonfiction and, and, and build exactly. that. Exactly. Okay. Yes. okay. And there are excellent resources online to just say, a good book in science for a fourth grader. Right, and right. So the, the resources in that realm are wonderful. Right, and on Testing Mom, we have lots of libraries that you can just, that have wonderful uh, books right. as well that are just right there. Do you think there's a difference between reading on a tablet and a book? Would you What's say it's shown. important to, yeah, to do both? It's been shown in yeah. general, reading from a book leads to greater attention okay. and greater retention. Okay. Um, I, of course, was raised that way. I mean, I do a lot of work on the computer. Mm -hmm. So for me, you'd expect it, but they're finding it even with younger children, you know, mm -hmm. the young generation. Um, there are certain limitations to the, to the screen, and uh, especially for sustained reading, for, for comprehension of complex ideas. Okay. Um, now, here's somebody who says, um, that uh, she's been reading, her young child at two has been reading uh, for some time. Wow. That does uh, happen. That, that it's ha yeah, it's amazing. That's, anyway, but it says, okay, she says that um, she hasn't really been working with her on teaching her sight words because she just doesn't want to teach her how to memorize, you yeah. know, things. Um, and sometimes she skips over the shorter sight words when she's reading. Should she be teaching those? sight words, those, which it sounds like the non-content words. Yes, they are, yeah. Um, without knowing more about how the teaching is going on, I'd rather yeah. not comment. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, one of the possibly easy ways of dealing with this, I'm not sure, but is for the mother to read the sentence and then the child to read it after her. Okay. So the child has the model, and if, he, if, if she leaves out a word, the mother can say, but I said was. So let, look, the boy was sitting. Now you do that. Um, it's, uh, if she wants her to attend to, to the non-content words, that's the way to do it. Mm. Oh, that's a way to do a it. A way to do it, okay. Um, okay, so she's, uh, this question is, how do you define reading failure and what can be done about it once you have a child who has failed? Well, that'll vary according to the different educational districts but, or, and countries, but in general, it's two years behind grade level. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, you can't be mm -hmm. a poor reader until like fourth grade, which is too late. You, know? right, you can't yeah. be a poor reader in second grade because you can't be two years behind grade level. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, if a child has great appropriate material and is struggling, he's in difficulty. Mm -hmm. And so even though he won't make the official definition okay. of failing in reading. Okay. And uh, there should not, of course, there'll be some error. Error is part of learning. But if the error rate, for example, exceeds 10% in reading, like on a page, there are more than 10% errors, or in writing, if there's more, then that material is too hard. And if the material is age appropriate, then it's likely the child has difficulty in reading. And then if you see that, that that's going on, that's, that would be your signal to intervene. And, yes. And now I would intervene. I would not intervene with phonics. Mm -hmm. um, there's an, there's, it, it, it's, it's the failure rate of phonics is astronomical. Mm -hmm. Even though everybody says, I believe in it. They talk about it like a religion. Um, 
so uh, that's why I developed the, the programs I've developed because I've just seen <laughs> so much failure and I wanted to help people prevent the failure. Right, right. Um, so Sarah says, Dr. Blank, thank you for your advice around teaching young children to recognize letters. If this is not explicitly taught to children, is the thought then that they're better learning this naturally as they read? Or is there another technique that you recommend to teach letter recognition to younger children? Well, first of all, I definitely teach letter recognition. I don't teach letter names. Oh, I teach okay. letter recognition as soon as we start. So that, for example, when I teach writing, handwriting, mm -hmm. we're teaching, if, if I make the letter, let's say J, the child makes the letter J. He's not gonna make the letter L. Um, so letter recognition is very important and it is better taught by seeing visual models than naming. So, and also with spelling, uh, when a child says, for example, mommy, how do you spell house? Instead of saying H-O-U-S-E, you just hold up the word house. Okay. Take look at it. Take it away. You're going to be developing visual memory, which is vital for reading. Letter naming is not vital for reading. But if you hold it up, take it away and say, now write it. Can't do it. You say, do it again. Then he could copy it. And then you take it away and do it from memory. The big thing is you've got to get letter recognition into memory. Mm -hmm. And that's vital. So it isn't that I don't teach letters. I just don't teach the names. But most of the children will pick it up as we go along. And if they don't, and you want to teach it at that point, it's quite easy to teach. Mm -hmm. You know, if the child is producing all the letters, reading somewhat effectively, and you want to teach the letter names, you won't have any difficulty. Mm -hmm. If you've done the other first. If you've, if you've, the big thing is to build up letter recognition and memory recognition for letters, which receives only, so for example, we've known for decades that all the spelling assignments that schools give are worthless. There isn't one study that shows they're of any value. Now, every, not every, huge numbers of schools still have. Monday, you write the list of words. Tuesday, you look them up in a dictionary. Wednesday, you give the definition. Thursday, you write them in a sentence. Those are all worthless because they don't require the child to put in any real attention into, the, into what's going on. But they've done, why? Because it's easy. It's easy to send it home, but if you speak to a parent of a child with a spelling problem, they'll tell you they'll have an hour's fight every night. They'll say, Joey, you've got to do this. I hate it. I'm not going to do it, Mom. And it goes, you know, these endless fights. Mm -hmm. And um, so we need better techniques. Now, uh, by the way, this, for parents who are interested in vocabulary, this is a neat little technique. I'll just give it. When they say to children, write a sentence with the vocabulary, word, the children always write the simplest, easiest sentence, and they learn nothing. Mm -hmm. I like, they'll do kangaroo. I like kangaroos. Puppy, I like puppies. Cookies, I like cookies. <laughs> uh, and the teacher will say, oh, but you're always writing the same thing. What is very good is for the parent to start a sentence with the word in it, have the child complete it, and then write that whole sentence. So let's say the word is problem. So you say to the child, even though there was a problem, the girl was able, and then they, they have to come up with, to fix it, to handle it, and they say, now write the whole thing. So if the parent produces a complex, interesting sentence with the word, it eases the load for the child, and it actually teaches them the meaning, and mm. it teaches writing and accurate spelling at the same time. Oh, okay. It's a great technique. If you do two words a day like that, Consistently, your child's going to have a fabulous vocabulary. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a good, very good, uh, yeah. great, great idea. Okay, I love that. Um, okay, so uh, now here's uh, a sixth grader. My sixth grade son who loved to read has no more desire in re to read. He'll go as far as the school assignment, I guess, asks, and then he stops right there. I don't see any motivation and focus of, on reading with him anymore, and I can't force him to do it. What do you What do you think? Well, the issue is: is he doing it effectively for the school assignments? If he is, the parent really has to live with that. In other mm -hmm. words, he's doing everything he's being required to do. Okay, he's handling it well. It would be nice if he loved reading, but mm -hmm. he can't make some. But if he's having problems, 
then you've got to intervene in a more active way. And what would you do in a situation like that? They're in sixth grade already. And if you, let's say they weren't doing so well, would you want to have them assessed to try to figure out what's going on? Yeah, I think that would be the best thing because it's a complex situation at that point. Right. You want, if, if there's something holding him up, you really want to get past what's holding him up. Got but it. if he's doing well, just it's leave okay. it and yeah. count your blessings. <laughs> okay. How can you help with mirror writing? I'm not sure what that is. Does that mean like backwards writing? Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, it, sometimes it can mean writing was or saw, mm. you know, or sometimes it can mean writing B is D. So right. it really depends. Um, uh, it's, it's funny, this, this probably won't help the person, but years ago, I, I, uh, someone sent me a child to study. He wrote fabulous, it's, it's, Leonardo da Vinci was a mirror writer. He wrote pages and pages backwards. It takes a lot of skill. This kid did it. And then I asked him to read and write. I said, do it regularly. And he was perfect. I said, why do you do it the other way? He says, it makes it more interesting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And I can understand because when you're doing a lot of school stuff, it can be very boring. So right. this kid just decided to enliven his life a bit. Uh -huh. So I don't really know what the mirror writing is. If it's a inability of the child to do it, then you'd have to deal with a specific test. Like what I told you with a J, you just don't let it happen. Um, if the child is doing it with words, you can hold the word, let them copy it, take it away and let them do it from memory. But I'm not sure the, ex uh -huh. the extent to which the mirror writing. Mirror writing by itself is no problem. It's mm -hmm. just if it's interfering with the child's ability to do it correctly. Okay. Okay. So you, you might uh, see if, the, if you hold it up and if they can do it correctly. Yeah, then. right. And, they, and if they're reading correctly and if they're basically, if it happens occasionally, just you don't have to worry, don't worry about, about it at about all. It. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, my seven-year-old has good decoding skills, um, but his comprehension is not at the same level um, due to his, uh, he has attention dif uh, deficiencies yeah. uh, and language delays. Yeah. How do I help him in comprehension and how do I improve his sort of mega cognitive skills? Well, that's a lot. Well, but, we, we yeah. actually have a program on ASD reading okay. called Steps to Stories. And although the ASD reading is focuses on children with autism because it's such a growing number, it really is an excellent program for building attention and comprehension. So I would just do steps to stories. Now, one of the demands of steps to stories is that the children have to imitate the mm -hmm. sentences that are in the stories and they can get quite complex and we build up. So that takes a lot of attention and a, it builds up the child's uh, language and attention skills and at the same time teaches comprehension. If he does well on that, he could go then into story smarts, mm -hmm. which is um, the next higher level up. Mm -hmm. And that's an ASD reading. Uh, ASD. No, story smarts is on uh, Reading Kingdom. And that's on Reading Steps Kingdom. Steps to stories is in ASD reading. That's a different program. But it's, it's a very, see one of the things that people don't realize when they teach comprehension, they ask a lot of specific questions, which are really not at all useful. Okay. The key to comprehension is being able to grasp the main idea. Mm -hmm. And kids have a hard time with that. So we do a lot of mo modeling. We don't say, give me a summary. Mm -hmm. We actually model, leave information out, then have the child gradually reproduce the whole summary. Uh, so the, the good news is it only takes about three or four months and the, the children get the skills. And once again, once they have the skills, they don't lose them, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and that that's inside of Reading Kingdom Story Smarts, where they yes. can work on that. And then yeah. Steps to Stories is in ASD reading. Exactly. Okay. Um, okay. She has a child. Here's here's a mom whose child is going to kindergarten in the fall. Not interested in reading, and doesn't understand much when I teach him something like rhyming words. Is there any trick I can use? What would you say in in that case? Uh, I, what she's talking about is what I mentioned before, phonological awareness. Yes, yes. She's going to get a lot of that in school. It actually does not teach reading. They just had a major, even though it's been, all the schools have shifted over to it, 
they just did a, a couple of years ago, a major study in England on all the studies of phonological training around the world. And they found not one study clearly supports that it teaches reading. What they have is good readers can do it, but making children who are not good readers do it doesn't make them into good readers. Oh, okay. um, well, so basically she can let the school handle it from their end. And if she wants, she could use Reading Kingdom, which bypasses it and teaches reading without any of that kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. Well, so yeah, so wait and see how the child does in the fall, but also maybe see if the child wants to go on Reading Kingdom now. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Because it's it's online and a lot of kids do like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, um, well, we just talked about someone's asking a question about comprehension skills. Um, someone wants to know about improving comprehension skills and framing long sentences. Um, any thought? I think we just kind of talked about that. But yeah. Do anything else? To um, add? One of if a if a child's willing. Mm -hmm. One of the best things, and it takes only about five minutes a day, okay. is to take a book where uh, the child is able, with four or five trials, to imitate each sentence. So here, for, let me see. Here, for example, now this is too hard. This is actually from Wind in the Willows. It was small wonder then that he suddenly uh, flung his brush on the floor. But you can say, uh, you find a, an easier book, which says things like, um, the, the child was amazed at the fireworks, and you have the child imitate it. And uh, if that's too easy, he does it, you have slightly longer, like the child was amazed at the fireworks with all the colors that it, they contained. You know? And if you get the child to imitate five complex connected sentences each day, you're going to build up comprehension. Oh, it's okay. Nobody uses uh, imitation as a technique, but you see, it's very hard to get children to say complex sentences. Mm. If you just sort of say, why did you do that? They'll say, cause, you know, they're not gonna give you a long explanation, mm -hmm. but if you ha give them the imitation, it gives them the practice in producing complex sentences. And that is absolutely vital to comprehension. And you could really turn that into a game. Absolutely. Like, you know, and you could have the child do it to you. Right. So you could, you can play it around, or mm -hmm. you could uh, sort of say, draw a picture of that now. Mm -hmm. And you can play around, but really what you want to get in is five sentences in the session, do it three or four times a week, and you're going to have amazing results within a few weeks. Okay. All right, good. And then here's one. My child is four and a half and is not liking phonics. Um, we uh, do a lot of reading at bedtime. Great. He loves that but the child is not interested in reading the Bob book series. Um, how do I get her interested in, in learning to read? She doesn't like Bob, you know, the Bob book series. I haven't <laughs> seen, I remember seeing it a long time ago, little but I had whole little booklets that teach, yeah. you know, word, word yeah. groups, like similar sounding letters. And yeah. I, uh, again, I, <laughs> that's why I produced it. Re I'll do reading kingdom. Reading but kingdom. one of the yeah. things you can do, which is very uh -huh. helpful, is have the child construct a book with you. Mm -hmm. It could, you could use the Bob book as the model, or you could say, you know, here's this little tiger. Yeah. Let's, and you have eight little pictures and you say, this is his den. And you write, this is his den. And children, constructing the book and writing in the text, typing in the text, whatever you want to do, filling in part of the text is a very good way to get the children because they, they're constructing something, not just being a passive uh, mm. reader. Good uh, idea. Which, and, and especially if they already have negative feelings towards that, you want to avoid it. So make it more fun and they can create yeah. their own book. And, yeah. and with and, the words. And constructing books is a great, uh, a great way to teach reading. Okay. Um, how do I help my son with fluency? He's in second grade and seven years old, reading fluency. Um, we have a program, he's probably not ready for it, uh, Reading Kingdom 2. But basically what you do is you take, it, it, it's a technique, they can look it up online as well. It's called repeated readings or multiple readings. What you do is take a book that's a little hard for him, not very hard, produces about 10% errors or so. Mm -hmm. And you read, let's say, a little segment mm -hmm. and you read it 
as many times really as you think he needs it, maybe twice, maybe three times, then he has to read it back perfectly. Now, what I do, the difference when I use the technique is if he makes an error, I, I don't say to him, what do you think it is? Don't let him play around with it. You just say, no, that's the word garden. Now start from the beginning. So he's got to read perfectly these short segments. And if you do this on a consistent basis, you'll bet get fluency. Now, it me by consistent basis would mean, just as a guideline, something, given seven years of age, something like 20 sentences in a session, divided into maybe six little segments, okay? And um, just keep going with the book. You don't have, it just there are tons of books out there. But basically, it is that the child has to do repeated, accurate reading. Mm. And you will then get fluency. Fluency. Okay. Oh, there's more. We, we're getting to the end of the session, and there's more questions. Maybe I'll go 10 more minutes. Are you okay? okay? Sure. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll try to try to get some Senate, some things that I think will, you know, lots of people will be interested in. What is the best way to encourage your child to read more? If, you know, First of all, if you read more, that's a big yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Seeing a parent read, you're not going to get a child to read if you're not a reader. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's rare. I mean, mm -hmm. you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, there's lots of different things for reading. There are things, you can use the internet, you can use magazines, you can use books. Um, and um, if, the pair, if the child sees you reading, and you discuss the topics of reading, it's likely he'll read, but he's got to be able to do it well or he will not like reading. Okay, so we've got to make sure he learns how to read well That's because right. then yeah. he'll enjoy it. And and listen, I know that, I remember this, for, uh, that you know the, my teachers told me this when my kids were in school that I think from kindergarten to third grade, you're learning how to read. And then from third grade on, you're reading to learn. So you right. have to be able to read to learn. Right. So that it can cause so many problems in school, obviously, if you right. can, if you're struggling as a reader. So, um, okay. So here's a, a parent with a child who is only wants to read the Dog Man series or Captain Underpants kinds of books. He's very stubborn in his selection of topics, um, and uh, he he's okay in in math, but he does poorly in reading and writing. Um, an, an eight-year-old. Any thoughts on helping a child yeah, like that? That's covering a lot of issues because yeah. it, it's a whole learning style. Um, I don't know if Spectacular Bond wasn't written for a child like that, but they might find some of the techniques in Spectacular Bond helpful um, okay. in, in setting up kind of, yes, in setting up kind of agreements with the child as to what he'll tolerate and so on. Right, and to get Or one of the things that can be helpful if they can afford it is to get even a high school, a competent high schooler to mm -hmm. be the kind of tutor because the child is gonna be keen on the relationship and not as likely to have mm -hmm. the battles that they will with the, thought, with the parents. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and that's particularly the case with teenagers, it's almost, it's very difficult for a parent to tutor a teenager. But if you bring in an, a peer or a competent peer yep. or someone a little bit more advanced than that, it mm -hmm. can go very well. It, you got to know the, the, you have to take the relationship into account. Right. Okay. Um, and um, here's uh, someone wants to know, uh, is, is there a number of pages in a book is there a number of pages or books that kindergarten should read every day? Um, she's, the mom feels overwhelmed or, um, and the child's resisting reading. So is there some like magic number or you should Well, I think basically they've gotten, it sounds like they've gotten stuck in a, a battle of wills here. So yeah. they ought to step back. And if the parent has a, a nice relative, a grandmother or an aunt or so, who can come in and sort of help them unlock the yeah, tangle yeah. that they've gotten. And that's the first thing. Because if the mother's miserable at it and the child's miserable, you, you want to get out of that situation. Okay. You don't want to be miserable. No. <laughs> it's not going to go well. Okay. That's a good idea to try with someone else and maybe. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Mm. Well, let's see. I just want to try to see if I, we can get into, well, here's um, one that you, I'm sure, will know something about. Okay. My daughter is a kindergartner, soon to be first grade. She's autistic. She's had age appropriate intellectual development, has a good, profound memory, loves reading, loves being read to. She can, loves chapter books. Her wow, school has a phonics great. intensive reading program. She is struggling. She struggles with inference and placing things in categories. She's frustrated by words that don't follow the rules like cat, city, moon, look. Yeah. She's very literal, takes rules as set in stone. Um, she excels in math. She's having a hard time learning to read. She's been memorizing lists of sight words sent home and has, has been able to recognize was and now insists that it is was, you know, after learning yeah. CC words. What should she do? Any well, I, I really, that's what ASD was created for. Oh, perfect. So okay. ASD reading is what I'd say. I mean, all the material is there. Mm -hmm. um, these sessions are short. Uh, it's teaching all the things that the parent says this child doesn't like doing. But it sounds also like this kid is doing very well, you know, with, like with her diagnosis. Yeah. And so that she should do well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Now here's here's a first grader loves to read, but the same books over and over again. Is that okay? Um, or yeah, would you all, make them do other books too? Well, let's separate between the books the child reads to himself and okay. the books that the parent reads. The parent can say, "If you want those books, that's fine. Those are your books. When you go to bed, you can read them." But when I'm reading, I'm gonna, and then the child can help pick some other books. Mm -hmm. But as, lo as long as the child's exposed to the other books, it'll be fine. Okay, that's the important thing. All right, I'm gonna ask two more questions and, and then I'm afraid we can't get to everybody's questions you, that you've been, this is so great. There's so many, you give so much good advice. Whenever I talk to you, I always learn so much. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. so. Well, I just think this is so common. Any other thoughts on this on this topic? For fi um, fifth or sixth grade boys who just want to do computer games, how do you encourage more real reading with books and discourage the overuse of computers with older kids? It's, I know it it's gets very hard. tough. It's yeah. very tough. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think you you probably the best thing if you can do it is have a kind of family conference. Mm -hmm. uh, and see what can be, but it's really hard to change uh, kids at that point. If, if they're strong, they're big, they know what they want, it, it's difficult. But hopefully you can have some rules that they agree to. Follow. Yeah, it, it, the older they are, that's why it's, if you can catch it when they're younger and try to establish those patterns of yeah. family reading and, and you know, not using a device after a certain yeah. time, all of that, it, it helps so much. But also the parents have to look at themselves. I, uh, it's the quarantine, uh, but of course I can go out to the park that's nearby. Yeah. 90% of the people are on their phones. Yeah. Even if they've been quarantined all day, they're out in this gorgeous park with beautiful flat and they're on their phones. Uh -huh. So if the parent is doing that, yeah. they don't have many grounds to say to the child, please don't do that. Okay. Um, I'm just amazed that they don't want to get away from their phones for an hour or so. Well, I've had a lot of kids say to us that they're getting really tired of their devices now because, oh, because of the teaching, on, the online teaching, that they're ready. They, they want to get back to school. They want to get back to their teachers and their, and their classmates. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so we've had a few questions about this. This will be the last question. Um, but... Um, well, okay, at home we speak Spanish, French, and English, and we're trying wow. to teach our son, you know, the alphabet, um, but we're trying to figure out, should we stick to one language? Should we do all three? You know, they, the letters and the rules all conflict with each other. Um, well, it all depends on how good he is. I mean, kids, if they have no language problems, can mm -hmm. learn multiple languages beautifully. In Holland, it's typical for the children to speak five languages. So if there's no trouble, but if there's trouble, then you should take, pick one language and get that solid. And then you could go to a second one after that. But so it really depends on the sort of stability of the child's learning. 
would you go with like, okay, Spanish is so much easier to learn to read in a way than English. Would, would Yeah, you... but if he's going to be in a school speaking English, I would go with English because that's okay. the language of the country. So, um, but it would depend if they're living in a real Spanish community and they go into a Spanish school, you know, may, that would be, you know, it, it, you've got to consider the total picture there. Yeah, yeah. I have one last question to ask because this is a, I've never heard this one before. Sure. Okay, you probably have. Um, my daughter seems to memorize stories rather than learn to decode the words. I'll read the pages to her and then ask her to do it independently. And she doesn't even look at the words. When I ask her to sound out the words, she doesn't like it. Is she learning to read or is she just perfecting her memory? It's unclear. Okay. Um, but what the parent can do, if she's willing, and make it sort of into a game, is to take the words, cut them up, and put them in different positions in the sentences. Uh, mm. So instead of the cat was in the box, it's now the mouse was in the box and the cat was outside, whatever it is. And um, so then the mother will know, uh, first of all, whether it's pure memory or uh, whether she's actually knowing those words. Um, and if it's pure memory, then you've got to devise, leave that and devise other techniques for teaching the decoding. Wow, there's just, this is so complex. This is such, is. no wonder you spent your whole life studying, <laughs> um, reading, my yeah. gosh. And every situation is so slightly different, you know, with yeah. every child. Um, gosh, okay, so I, I just want to say um, thank you to you because this was so informative. Um, I know parents had so many questions tonight. We really appreciate your time and effort and and just, you know, uh, for those of you uh, who would like, we, um, Reading Kingdom is, is, uh, was developed by, by uh, Dr. Blank. It's amazing. And it's got story smarts in it. It's got handwriting in it. Um, if you're a Testing Mom member, it's on Testing Mom. If you're not, you can just go get it. Um, then there's also ASD Reading. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who uh, sh this, that was recommended a few times tonight and um, ASD reading and steps to stories and people can find that online, right? Oh, yes. 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 Okay. It's, 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 it's a different website. And okay. for, if children have language problems, it's uh, a very good way to start because uh, have spoken language problems. Okay. Um, so children with learning difficulties, that's it's, it's a site that helps them learn language too. Okay, good. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Blank, Marion. Um, I appreciate it so much. And thanks to all the parents who were here tonight. This was so interesting. I learned so much as I always do when I talk to you. I, I appreciate it. And um, you know, I hope you get out tomorrow, that the, the weather's good in New York and you get a chance to take a, a nice walk, so. Thank you, and thank you. Okay. And uh, lots of luck to all the parents. Uh, they really care about this. And the good news is lots can be done. Uh, <laughs> and there's no reason for the failure uh, to continue when, if they're ex experiencing any, any failure. Absolutely, so thank you so much. We really thank appreciate you. it. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.